Our next speaker is Dr. Timothy Guilford. He received his medical training from the University of Texas Medical School. He completed his surgery internship at Johns Hopkins Hospital and residency at the University of Michigan. He's board, cert board certified in otolaryngology. The need for a therapeutic approach in treating allergies in children resulted in his initial interest in homeopathic medicine. And in 2002, he received the ACAM's Norman C. Clark Award for Innovation. Dr. Guilford's use of medical de med metal detoxification methods and research into the toxicity of mercury demonstrated that glutathione is a com critical component of the de defense against heavy metals. I'm going to just go ahead and say it. My, my new hero is uh, Freddie Mercury of Queen because he decided to live his life exactly as who he was. And I aspire to that. And uh, I appreciate very much being here to talk to you today. Um, glutathione has become a avocation and a vocation for me. So I'll read a disclaimer. I am involved uh, and have financial interest in a product in my talk and a company that uh, supplies monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. We have a booth, so I might as well be, you know, sell it, why not? Um, so glutathione is a critical factor in the ability of our cells to exist, and I'll show you this in just a minute. If you, your slides are available, I understand, so I'm not gonna worry about stopping to let you take notes. I'm gonna fly along and uh, at drguilford.com, I often put my slides up and, uh, afterwards. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me. Write me at drg at readysorb.com. Um, usually I start out with the basic science, but today I thought I would in, try and entice you by showing a study that I published with Ben Asher, another otolaryngologist um, from New York City in which we showed that all the common ENT conditions are associated with low glutathione. This is a peer-reviewed study. This is a dozen conditions ranging from rhinitis to laryngitis, which he and I both have treated, and I've used liposomal glutathione successfully in these treatments. Uh, as we go along, I'll make the point that it's not necessarily a standalone <clears throat> material. I wanted to emphasize the role of pollen allergy, however. Pollen actually has a uh, oxidative stressor in its casing. So when it hits the mucosa, it causes oxidation stress, that alters the glutathione, that changes your immune response into a condition we know as Th2, we'll talk about a little more, in which antibodies are made. And one of the antibodies, as part of a defense against the invader, is I specific IgE. And so that's kind of the summary of uh, allergy, which occurs as a two-signal phenomenon. One, the oxidation stress, and two, the inflammation we know that becomes allergy. So back to the basics. This is a model of glutathione. There are three amino acids you heard about earlier, starting from the bottom up, glutamine, cysteine, and glycine. And it now appears that both cysteine and glycine are critical for the function. But cysteine, in this case, has a big, prominent sulfur molecule that can donate a hydrogen atom, known as a proton, and an electron, which is the real key to how glutathione works. The structure of glutathione is quite unique, and there's only one enzyme that will break it down. This is called gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. The other three enzymes at the top interact with that active sulfur group and receive the hydrogen that it can be handed off. The transferases are involved in detoxification, the peroxidases in preventing peroxide damage, and reductase is an enzyme that will take the oxidized form of glutathione. I remember it as gain electron, you're reduced, and that means it can redonate an electron. And Leo, which uh, is like lose an electron, you become oxidized. So this is the oxidized state, and glutathione likes to mate up with another glutathione in the area when it becomes oxidized, and then that reductase enzyme can come in and break those two apart so it becomes active again. That's the active component of glutathione, reduced glutathione, so-called reduced. That's just a chemical term for having that uh, proton and electron available. Oh. So glutathione is critical to our mitochondrial function, and it turns out that the cytoplasm of the cell encasing the mitochondria 
produces glutathione, and there are two separate genetically uh, determined pumps that carry glutathione into the mitochondria. And without that, the re reactive oxygen species that are formed along the electron transport chain would actually damage the mitochondria and prevent our energy production. I mentioned the peroxidase, which the glutathione will take a proton and direct uh, hydrogen and add it to the OH hydroxyl molecule to create harmless water. Here I can point out the harmless water over here. And uh, the, the peroxidase enzyme, all these enzymes speed up the reaction. That's what en enzymes do. And so they put uh, glutathione in close proximity to the hydroxyl and that creates water and then glutathione becomes oxidized and that becomes reduced again by the reductase and this goes on a million times in your cells every day. So the origin of your energy systems is your mitochondria. And if you remember, they're a small organelle living inside a large cell. Some scientists believe that they actually were free living organisms at one time. At that time, they could get rid of their reactive oxygen species, their free radicals, just into the local environment. But inside the cell, they can't. And that's why you needed something like glutathione to allow this reaction and both the small mitochondria and large cell to continue working. There's a woman named Lynn Margulis. I love that name. She uh, actually was married to Carl Sagan. Sagan? I don't know how you say that. They had a child named Zach. And while Lynn was working on developing her ideas about these free-living organisms actually becoming encased, that's part of the um, idea of the evolution of our cells, is that these organisms are working together. In this case, in a relationship that I show here that's been going on for over a billion years. I don't think we can even conceive of that, but it's over, over a one and a half billion years these organisms have been working together. First, the mitochondria metabolized oxygen to allow the big cell to live, and that's critical. And then, it, so in our oxygen world, this works well. Anyway, Lynn Margulis' son, Zach, said, Mom, if you and Lovelock think that the Earth is a Gaia, a, a living entity, does that make the humans living there symbionts? And she has a beautiful little book published in 98 called Symbiotic Planet. I would add to that now, we need to ask the question, are we symbionts or are we parasites? That's a common uh, in our culture right now. So there's an oxidant stat inside the cell that this NERF2 gets released when oxidation stress occurs. It breaks some little cysteine bonds and it can transmit, transfer to the nucleus and turn on the production not only of glutathione, but all these other little uh, associated enzymes. Uh, I mentioned the transferase. Well, oh. <laughs> I don't know where I am now. I mentioned the transferase and um, all the attendant enzymes that get produced that help glutathione work in your favor. Now, most of you are familiar with the methionine cycle. And that's the MTHFR, which hands off a, meth a methyl group to B12 to form methionine. Somebody asked me about that. I didn't put the slide in, but you actually need glutathione to protect that methionine molecule before it gets uh, methylated. So you need glutathione to keep that cycle working. Cysteine is formed from that cycle. And then there's two enzymes down here at the bottom, GCL and GS, that form glutathione. So once again, You've got these enzymes working together, and the glutamyl transferase sits on the outside of the cell. When a cell needs more glutathione, it raises this flag, and this enzyme breaks glutathione down into the three amino acids. Well, once we've learned that, we all thought, well, automatically it makes glutathione. It turns out that you need the action of these enzymes inside the cell to form glutathione. We've got GCL, glutamine cysteine ligase, putting together the first component, glutamine synthase, glutathione synthase, GS, in the next step. And you also need two subunits, GCLC and GCLM. C for catalytic, and that's responsible for 60% of the glutathione production. If it's missing, your glutathione's been reduced by 60%. Modifier unit, probably only 30 or 40%. It turns out that these enzymes, once again, 
depict it a little different way, but you can see them both ways. But it turns out there's single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, that determine the function of these enzymes. So up to 20% of our population may be running a little low on a normal day. They can function, but if they take a big oxidizing hit, then they may have a problem. So you have glutathione surrounded by an enzyme system, and this is the key to glutathione, I think. Not only does it work independently, but in concert with these enzymes, peroxidase, GST, but also it supports immune function and myriad other enzyme functions inside the body. So you really need glutathione on a constant basis. We mentioned the transferases. They're a library that is designed for each, almost every toxin has a transfer, uh, transferase that will bind it and carry it in close proximity to glutathione, bind the toxin. So you literally put them in close proximity um, that allows the enzyme reaction to occur. And in a study done in astrocytes, Gail Zivok at uh, Rutgers University of New Jersey Medical Dental showed that liposomal glutathione goes into cells 100 times more efficiently than plain glutathione. And she conjectured it's this transfer and reconstruction inside the cell that the liposome bypasses by bringing glutathione into the cell and it protected against two pesticides, Monem and Paraquat, in her cell cultures. And I would submit to you that it works even better when you, they have the appropriate transferases there. So in reading about glutathione, oh, oh, backwards. So in reading about glutathione, you'll see various markers. There's uh, lipid peroxidation uh, markers such as oxidized low-density lipoprotein, this 4-HNE. I will let you read it. Malon dialdehyde MDA. And there's also an oxidation marker for DNA, that, that 8 hydroxy deoxyguanidine that shows that DNA has been oxidized. And you can see articles, usually with each one of these, almost no article talks about all three or two, uh, which I think would be interesting to say the least. But uh, you'll see oxidized LDL in a minute and 4 HNE, the H hydroxy nonio, will, will pop back up. So glutathione can be decreased by genetics, I'll show you. Toxins bind it and prevent it from functioning they, as they re are removed by glutathione. Um, metals, uh, mycotoxins are very critical. Glutathione binds mycotox mycotoxins and facilitates its removal. So each one of these is depleting glutathione and some of them are also preventing the formation of glutathione. Intriguingly, viruses, we'll talk about HIV as one, um, RSV actually breaks down the formation of that for, uh, NERF2 that I showed you that transferred to the nucleus, and that's why this respiratory virus is so commonly associated with things like uh, chronic asthma and stuff. It, it really interferes with the function in that area. Here's the, a lung with, um, what do we got here? A macrophage cell sitting there looking lonely. Here's another one. Science used to think that the lung was a privileged site. There was no big immune reaction. Actually, the macrophages are working like crazy in there. When you get particulate matter, they pick them up, digest it, and remove it. No big deal. But if they're not functioning well, you'll get a secondary response with neutrophils. That's like the cavalry riding over the hill to attack the invader, and then you got all hell breaks loose. You know, and that's when you have inflammation and congestion. So the macrophage plays a huge role in all that. And also in uh, cystic fibrosis, there's a transfer membrane that carries glutathione into the extracellular lung fluid and concentrates it 150 times higher than regular uh, blood level of glutathione. So these macrophages actually soak up their glutathione out of the ELF, and that's what keeps them functioning as well as your surfactant uh, to function well. It turns out in uh, cystic fibrosis, that a GCL modifier gene, like the GCLM or GCLC, determines the severity of cystic fibrosis. So you get the transfer membrane, the CFTR, transfer receptor not working, okay, you've got a genetic problem. But if you're not making adequate glutathione, they've actually shown in this study as reference that shows that the severity of glutathione is determined by those SNPs that I mentioned occur far more commonly than we realize. Every 
human in this country has, uh, it says 99.6 percent of adults have lead and mercury. So it's worth thinking about that. If you're adding more mercury into a person by whatever methods uh, m you may be involved with, almost everybody already has a baseline. So you're just adding on top of that. And, and methylmercury has been associated with, you know, myriad problems. Here's an example of cobalt, in this case cobalt-60, which has been put into a rat's liver, and they were given plain glutathione orally, did nothing, and then they gave them intravenous glutathione. Ah. <laughs> then they gave them intravenous glutathione. I'm getting this slowly but surely. Um, and that worked extremely well. But here, oral liposomal glutathione worked almost as well as IV in terms of the removal of the toxin from the liver of these animals. And I would submit that you can give the oral form several times a day if you choose to. So mercury not only binds glutathione, but certain forms of, will actually block the glutathine, glutathione synthase enzyme itself. So that's kind of a double whammy. And uh, here's an article that uh, shows how mercury may have led to accumulate problems in children with autism. And this is from 2019, and this is by Dr. Faber, who lives in uh, western Pennsylvania. And he points out in the article that his uh, cohort was particularly susceptible to this because they lived downwind from the coal-fired generation plants in the area, all of which emit mercury. So he found a lot of mercury in these kids. But he went on to make the statement that Things, glutathione's importance in facilitating detoxification of xenobiotic agents, he was talking about mercury, and its antioxidant functions suggests they may play a role in the etiology of autism. Well, we had a study done back in 2011 in which our product was used to restore glutathione levels. Children with autism have low glutathione in their serum. It restored the glutathione. One of the kids dropped out and they didn't report this. He went back to, main, of the dozen, he went back to mainstream school. So they reported some little upset kind of reactions and side effects, but nothing major. So children were shown to tolerate this quite well. Um, but I would submit to you that it, there's, that's a more complicated situation. And I would not now expect a single modality to solve that problem. Uh, talking about vaccination, imagine what I just talked about, genetics, metals, depleted glutathione for a while, and then you come along and give that kid an oxidizing vaccination. Influenza causes an increase in oxidized LDL cholesterol for two weeks in healthy 17 to 30-year-old men. So just imagine what it might do to a small child who has a compromised system. And I think this is where the concept that vaccinations cause problems. I was hoping to show this to Dr. Wakefield, so if somebody wants to pass that along, I'm happy to talk to him. Um, I think that this is where we get the idea. It's always the last straw that caused the problem. And of course, that's kind of logical, but you have, we don't think of the milieu upon which it was added. So in uh, the factors that uh, we need to consider in depletion of glutathione and the other thing we don't consider is what happens when glutathione is low. Remember that story about opening the barn door and all the cows got out too late to shut? Well, when you open the barn door of low glutathione, it's what comes in. What have you accumulated? We said it, metals. What else? Mycotoxins, chemicals we can now measure, and other uh, biologic materials such as viruses, fungi. And we don't know anything about parasites. I would urge you to take a course with Dr. Simon Yu to see his perspective on what parasites may be doing. It's kind of like coronavirus. If we don't have a test for coronavirus, it doesn't exist. Nobody has it, right? If, you're not, if you don't test positive, you don't have it, right? If you don't have a test? Well, same thing with parasites. We don't have a test for it. I would look into Simon Yu and his technique and his approach if you're planning on treating adults or children, especially those with the accumulation problems we just mentioned. Turns out that the serum level of reduced glutathione predicts decreased cognitive function in otherwise healthy men, women, healthy people with aging who were aging healthy, their glutathione drops, their cognitive function goes off. There's also another 
unexpected thing. In Alzheimer's disease, that GCLC enzyme is not expressed in their brain cells. And this was done by a group that uh, I've studied with. They had a young man who wanted to learn about Alzheimer's. And he said, do you think it'll show something? And I said, I'm pretty sure. But I was very surprised to find GCL is not expressed in these people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, once again, Bredesen talks about curing Alzheimer's. He's really talking about all the factors that deplete glutathione. I've tried to write him and talk to him, but he's busy. The point I want to make is that when you detoxify people, give them the appropriate vitamins, and do that type of thing, they have a chance to get better. And it's funny, he's also big on uh, fixing the thyroid. Well, it turns out there's a study that was done in uh, uh, people with uh, Alzheimer's that showed that they have an increase in their reverse T3. Remember, T4 goes to form T3. There's two enzymes dialernase 1 and 2 that form the T3 normally. But what we don't know is that low glutathione affects the uh, function of these enzymes, especially the, the number 2, which is important in forming normal T3. But dialernase 3 keeps working with low glutathione, and so you can accumulate reverse T3. And that's what they found in this study by uh, Sampi in uh, Denmark in these people that had been exposed to mold in a schoolroom for years and years. And the adults and children, often the adults had very low thyroid function, and they found that Cytomel was quite helpful in these people. And I would submit to you that restoring their glutathione, that may explain why some people say they feel more energetic when they take liposomal glutathione, but I can't, I don't have proof of that. So I published a paper with Jeanette Hope, who's known to many of you people in environmental medicine, in which we showed that uh, mycotoxins are documented to deplete that GCLC enzyme. So this is where mycotoxins come in, and this is where Sompi's group uh, showed that they, people exposed to mold had problems related to glutathione function, really, although they focused on the thyroid. Um, those are all referenced. So there's a number of health conditions that are associated with low glutathione. You mentioned autism. Turns out that low serum glutathione, same stuff we're talking about, predicts mortality if you have heart disease. This was done in a major study at Emory University. Uh, non uh non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, that NASH syndrome, has low glutathione. HIV, um, those people don't express the GCLC enzyme. Alzheimer's, they talked about. Diabetes is a real surprise. When you have metabolic syndrome, you can make some glutathione pretty well. When you slip into uh, the increased glucose of diabetes, the formation of GCLC is shut off, and you get, become low glutathione. Think about the complications of diabetes. What are they? Small vessel disease, heart disease. Some people have brain problems, eye problems. I can show you each one of these is dependent on glutathione. Cystic fibrosis, we mentioned, mycotoxin. For some reason, systemic lupus erythematosus does not express that GCLC. There's two articles showing that, one single article and then a, a meta-analysis, but they don't tell you why. But you can imagine all the things we've talked about. Now, here's a little homegrown experiment. This is my leg, and you can see this um, little hair follicle here has accumulated purulent material, some redness, dolor, color, and rhubarb, the classic signs that you learn for inflammation. All right there. Normally, I would just wipe that off with a washcloth and forget about it, right? In this case, what I did was drop liposomal glutathione on it for a, f for a while. And uh, an artist would represent this accumulation of purulent material and a few bugs. It's actually the accumulation of the membranes of all these dead cells that have gone in to defend you. The, the neutrophils, the, the macrophages that didn't make it. What happens to that? What happens to cholesterol in the body? How does it get to the liver? Well, you're told it does that. Were you taught that macrophages metabolize cholesterol and turn that over to HDL? There's an HDL-triggered, macrophage-dependent cholesterol efflux that's tremendously critical for allowing your cells 
to get rid of excess cholesterol. That's through the ABC transporters, and there's a reference for you. The major function of macrophages is to engulf these apoptotic cells, and they have to have a massive cholesterol efflux in order to function normally. Hmm. Even Freddie took a sip of water doing his presentation. So what you have is macrophage ingesting apoptotic neutrophils that have the cavalry that has come in to help stop this invasion. And so when these macrophages ingest those cells, they have to be able to excrete it. And I'll show you in a minute a study that documents that, cholesterol, that liposomal glutathione, that, that this is a glutathione-dependent function. So here's the follicle. The white bar represents the original size. It, uh, the, two, the top and bottom are two different uh, angles to get, try and get a little color variation so you can see this. Here you are at three and a half hours. 24 hours is much reduced. And then by 36 hours, it's virtually gone. Where did all that stuff go? Well, those macrophages chewed it up. They were supported by glutathione. They could function. Where else in the body do you accumulate cell membranes like that? How about in the smooth muscle cell in your arteries, in your coronary arteries? Then bacteria may have, some people think, that play a role there. But that's just another cholesterol mass. And there's plenty of studies that now show that the removal of that cholesterol mass is critical to avoiding atherosclerosis. Here's a study in animals from 2007. I thought we were going to be big time when I saw this study published in atherosclerosis, of all things, by some major researchers. Michael Avarams published over 300 papers. In there, I didn't get it quite at first. It took me a couple of years. The HDL-induced macrophage cholesterol efflux was increased 80% in these animals designed to get atherosclerosis. That ended up in a reduction of their atherosclerosis by 30%. But the key factor is that HDL efflux. Uh, there was a typo that could have added to our misery. It was actually 78%, and that's on the page there. When I told Michael Avram there was a typo, he just said to me, oh, you found a typo, congratulations. It's like, well, I'm not sure anybody really understands what Certainly, I don't get any feedback from the companies I've tried to talk to about this. Um, so now you've got oxidized cholesterol in your coronary arteries. And so the macrophage comes chugging in there, and it's got a receptor site called CD36. CD36 is designed to pick up oxidized LDL, old cholesterol, pathogens. That's why your macrophages are hot onto pathogens the CD36, and there's no gate on it. What does that mean? It means it's going to keep taking in cholesterol and type those products until the cell is stuffed, as you see on the right-hand side. That's called a foam cell. So articles now document, this is from 2015, I think, document that macrophage and, and reduced glutathione are key in avoidance of atherosclerosis. And now you know why it makes so much sense. And if you don't have adequate glutathione, then you get a necrotic core and the macrophage is accumulated there. That creates more inflammation. You may get a rupture and accumulation of problem. That's sudden, a sudden myocardial infarction. I know a little bit about that. Um, but I think uh, there's some ways to avoid it. It turns out that over time, that modifier unit GCL is also a SNP in there is associated with myocardial infarctions. In other words, 50, 60-year-old person with an MI, they may have a decrease in their ability to make glutathione. Is that important? Well, the study from Emory showed that uh, serum glutathione levels combined with oxidized cysteine, if they can't reduce the cysteine in their serum, it predicts mortality. Remember mortality? That's an endpoint in uh, coronary artery disease. <laughs> and uh, so serum glutathione predicts that endpoint. So it's pretty critical. Um, here's a study that looked at macrophages in cell culture taken from people with HIV. They do not express that GCLC enzyme. This paper shows that, demonstrates that quite clearly. And it also shows that if you put in liposomal glutathione, it helps those cells function much more efficiently 
they not only raise glutathione, they can defend against infection because their macrophages can soak up bacteria. In this case, they use TB because the researcher, the primary investigator is an infectious disease expert. And uh, he showed that in that setting where those enzymes are not working, liposomal glutathione is a thousand times more efficient than N-acetylcysteine. Why? Because that cysteine has to be put through those same enzymes to be reconstructed, and those cells aren't using that enzyme properly. It's in the study very clearly. And they went on then to do a study in uh, people. So they were moving to the cells from people who ingested liposomal glutathione. They took their cells and they exposed them to TB. And I don't know if you can see from the right side of the room or your, your, your left side, but that on the left-hand side, you can see the red line. At 72 hours after they put TB organisms in there with their cells taken from people who ate the placebo, they had rapid growth of, glut of TB. In the people who had ingested liposomal glutathione on the right-hand side there, there's almost no growth at all. I think you guys can see that over here. I have to lean way over here. I'll really be fretting. I'll be flying in a minute. Um, so they went on to publish a study in humans. They looked at not only the ability of the cells to defend themselves, but also the cytokine function that occurred, the immune factors that all the scientists write about. You'll see all kinds of erudite studies on cytokines. What they don't write about is the fact that low glutathione changes your cytokine production. IL-6 goes up, IL-10 on the bottom, next to the bottom goes up, transforming growth factor beta, TGF-beta. Now, you don't think about that very much. Ironically, TGF-beta restricts the formation of GCL and the formation of glutathione. So if you have a problem causing an increase in TGF-beta, you may not be able to make enough glutathione. Uh, we could get into that maybe at the end if there's time. So they gave these people liposomal glutathione. If you look on the bottom, it reversed the elevation of IL-6 decreased IL-10, decreased TGF-beta, and increased those cytokines associated with normal cell function, particularly macrophage ingestion of bacteria and killing. Macrophages, I've found other studies that I didn't reference here, but they, they won't kill as efficiently if they don't have good antioxidant function. I mean, they're not intending to be self-destructive. When they're low in glutathione, they switch into this Th2 phenomenon that you see in the upper right. And this is the state in which you make antibodies. This is the state that occurs with allergy. And that's why they make antibodies to specific allergens. I would submit that you need a glutathione to appropriately make immune defense against invaders like viruses, for example. Well, it will shut down or help shut down the allergy response sometimes very nicely in my experience. And more importantly, this macrophage function against those apoptotic neutrophils that lay around and create problems, this controls inflammation. When they can ingest these neutrophils, it can shut off inflammation. And that's why that redness went away, the rhubar um, in the classical inflammation. They're ingesting the neutrophils, shuts off inflammation. And I think that's an important factor to remember. Um, gee, I'm moving along here. Oh, I, there's time right up here. I didn't know what time it was. How nice. Um, so let's talk about cancer and oxidation. You'll read a lot of papers that talk about oxidation stress associated with cancer. Here's one by another Pennsylvania researcher, this one over in Hershey. She had tissue from young women who elected reduction mammoplasty for whatever reason. And she looked at these tissues and he found they were loaded with that HNE oxidation marker. That's not only a marker, it's also a cause of oxidation stress. And she said that you see these kind of changes in the same phenotype that you would see in cancers. And went on to say this ought to be a warning to us the same way that we found the atherosclerotic streak, the lipid streak in the coronary arteries of young men who had been killed in, in action in Korea. She said that was an alarm that something was wrong with, these, with our culture in creating 
too much atherosclerotic plaque. She feels this should be the same type of warning, this lady uh, uh, Weiss. Um, so both oxygen species and nitrogen species are associated with cancer. Okay, why? There's a beautiful study I've referenced here by my friends at Jefferson University. I've met these people. They actually showed a nice little study that did not get published that suggested our product uh, certainly did not increase the uh, action of uh, cancer cells in, in vitro. But they went on, they used N-acetylcysteine. That's fine. And they showed when you raise glutathione, the cells that have become glycolytic, there are proliferative cells, cancer, non-proliferative support cells. So I'm gonna switch that, I'm gonna go left is non-proliferative. So the non-proliferative cells are switched over to produce glucose, classic Warburg reaction, you've heard that. And they not only produce glucose, they start making lactic acid. Why is that important? It turns out that they also upregulate a transporter, number four, <laughs> which the monocarboxylate um, transporter number four, shuttles lactate out over to the proliferative cancer cell. That's the growing cell. Those cells maintain their mitochondrial function and they can use lactic acid for fuel. Now you've all of a sudden gotten a, a dominant cell dictator making everybody produce lactic acid for their benefit and the cancer can grow and develop all kinds of resistances. And earlier, uh, Dr. Duisberg mentioned that it's hard to get a single phenotype of the cells in cancer. There are multiple cells, different types of cells in cancer, but the ones that proliferate still have mitochondrial function and depend on this MCT4 extrusion. My friends, uh, um, Outshorn, I'm forgetting his first name, uh, gave NAC to these women who had breast cancer, they did a biopsy and showed the MCT4 was elevated in the support cells and MCT1 was elevated in the cancer. And then they gave them NAC, they raised their glutathione, they reversed that status. They just did this for a short time, it was a pilot study. Well, I called them up and I said, uh, I'm, block, I'm getting old. I said, Dr. Outshorn, I said, you need to be aware that NAC has a, a liability. He said, what? I said, here's a study that shows that in cells grown with NAC, the cytokine called TNF. Do you know what TNF is? Does anybody remember TNF? Tumor necrosis factor. You know why it got that name, right? That was the end of the era where they named things because of what they did. Now you have all these drugs, you have no idea what they do. It's got a fancy name. Tumor necrosis factor expression is diminished in cells with NAC. So you get a big growth of tuberculosis in those cells. But in the cells that were grown with liposomal glutathione, it allows the expression of the defense inside the macrophages to continue, and it reduces the growth, growth significantly. I said, if you want to have tumor necrosis factor in your cells in these people fighting against the cancer, don't use NAC. It was very nice. He responded to me. He, I've always had a nice relationship with these people. I was hoping to do a, a study, but then <laughs> I'm always hoping to do a study. And <laughs> yeah, maybe one day. Anyway, along the topic of cancer, I'm not telling you to use glutathione to treat or cure cancer. Some doctors make that part of what they do. But here's a paper that Simon Yu and I wrote. I had the privilege of uh, attending many of his conferences and getting some assessment and treatment myself. And I sat many hours in the IV room with people who had horrible diagnoses. I met one woman. She'd had uh, tooth work done many times for her wisdom, uh, cav wisdom teeth cavitations. I had to have one done a couple of times. So I want you dentists to listen up. And then um, she was also treated for antifungals and antiparasitic me medications. And the point is here, she had a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. She, went, she told me last time I saw her last year, I happened to see her several times. She said, uh, I went to the oncologist. You know what he told me? I said, what? He said, we're going to have to change your diagnosis. I went, what are you talking about? He said, yeah. He said, no one's ever lived this long with that diagnosis. You couldn't have it. So that's where we are. Um, I want to I 
this paper is not yet on my blog. I'll put it up there if you're interested. Uh, because they, for some reason, they, they didn't publish it online. They told me they would, but uh, keep trying. Um, it is really seminal in understanding this. I remember dictator cell, slave cell. I don't want to give you any images, uh, but <laughs> but they become they have like a parasitic relationship to our body. It's not a symbiotic relationship, and these parasites. I think they change their internal structure, so they respond to antiparasiticals. And there's a whole literature out there that shows that antiparasiticals can be anti-cancer, and we just need ways to decide what is needed and how much. And Dr. Yu has described in his literature and in our paper some a fabulous way of marrying the ancient art of acupuncture with the modern electrical world and the assessment that you can put people through. And it's important for dentists to understand this as well as physicians. Um, I'm not sure that you can't use this approach to treat almost any problem when you start thinking about it. And then you get very philosophical. The parasite issue, we don't have a test for it. So in the United States, we don't have a problem with parasites, right? I made that analogy earlier. Did that come across? So. Um, how are we going to assess for this? Again, please consider a course to learn about the impact that these things can have in suppressing the energy of your system. Oh, I put, I put my phone on uh, airplane mode because Dr. Yu put the, the 5G phone on uh, the plate and the energy in my nerve meridian went right down. And I was doing pretty good right before that. He put it on airplane mode. It, it went to normal. I've had uh, recurring episodes of what they call maybe gout, some inflammation. So we had treated fungus because that's been shown by Constantini to have a relationship. And also uh, Stephanie Seneff, S-E-N-E-F-F. -E She's worth reading from MIT. She talks about glyphosate substituting for glycine in glutathione. And maybe that's a contributing factor to the problem. Um, anyway, I went home and promptly my right foot got inflamed right along the outside. So that's weird. And I looked down and there was my Wi-Fi that I'd been sitting next to for several years. I said, oh, ha. So we moved that out of the room. I took a little colchicine. The inflammation went right down. But I'm optimistic. You'll have to invite me back in a year or so. And I'll, I'll, if nothing else, I'll walk up here and I'll learn a Freddie Mercury song and I'll sing it for you. I used to be able to sing. I, I wanted to be a singer. I stood up there when I was about 13 in a, in a tryout, and my voice cracked at that moment. <laughs> Most embarrassing thing you can imagine. But uh, I'll sing for you if you invite me back, and I'll let you know what my foot looks like at that time. Anybody have a question? Good. I covered it all. Brilliant. You guys are really attentive, and I appreciate so much the opportunity to talk to you.